guess I did not fit into a life of high finance. It's not to say I could not handle it. I managed to thrive after a decade or so. I just had a problem when client interest got stepped on. They told me that the client always came first and then the industry showed me how to not do what they said. The industry just could not live up to its claims when conflicts occurred. There was too much money involved and it caused people to forget right and wrong. Principles folded like a cheap tent in a Chinook wind. Out west, we used to live and work fairly close with our neighbors. In times past, we truly depended on them for survival and they depended on us. That is the feeling that my parents' generation gave me. A lesson in how to treat others as if you would like to be treated yourself. It works in a society where you need your neighbors. This is my dad when he was still alive, doing what he loved to do, play with old farm machinery. I love to watch him finally get to enjoy the toys that he had to work so hard with all his life. Here is how he was taught to treat his neighbors. This is the example he gave to me. Here's how I find neighborly treatment among the top bosses I found myself working for when I joined the financial industry. Each time I visit Toronto, the money capital of Canada, I take a tour of these neighborhoods. I go to learn how the other side lives. I used to envy these people, and now that I understand the price they pay to get here, what they have to give up, I find myself being sorry for some of them. My views are different. My perspective is unable to handle where some of these folks are coming from. This is also Conrad Black's neighborhood. I often wonder what he had to do to live here. Unfortunately, these are the people who run the money in Canada. I wonder if money can be that addictive. Maybe some are just as sick as some of the homeless people at the opposite end of the economic food chain. I remember when I was a kid, I liked to take things apart and see how they worked. Anything I could open up, I would. As an adult, I started to dissect the motivations and to follow the money of the financial business to see how it truly worked. I found some really unhealthy people, sick people. The problem always used to be, according to my mom, that things did not always go back together exactly the same as before I took them apart. I wonder if the financial business might change if I take it apart and look at the insides. I wonder if my insides might change if I try to dissect the financial business. My first lesson in corporate misbehavior was when Bud Jorgensen of the Globe and Mail newspaper uncovered the practice of sending mutual fund salesmen on free trips for selling certain mutual funds. I thought the practice was an obvious conflict and I saw it as a black eye on our business. I spoke in support of what the reporter was revealing, saying it was better to get it into the open than to hide it and be embarrassed by it later. Little did I know that my manager at the time was attending the Indy 500 each year for free, courtesy of plunking his clients into the McKenzie Fund. McKenzie sponsored an Indy car at that time, and for those top salesmen, the thrill on top of the free trip was being able to sit inside the race car as a bonus. I was told by him that anyone who speaks outside the firm about these free trips will be fired. It was my first lesson in a mafia-like code of silence to hide bad corporate behavior. How do you stand with Lobo? Huh? Come on, how do you stand with Lobo? Who's Lobo? That's good. They win. So which takes precedence? Our customers or our profits? That's a crazy question, eh, Jenny? I've always published articles in my local paper to educate investment clients. My second lesson in the Code of Silence was when I mentioned how to buy mutual funds free of charge in one of these articles. After all, there were so many ways to be paid. Commissions, trailing commissions, marketing incentives, we were all making a very good living now that the baby boomers had discovered investing. I thought that clients should not have to suffer just so that I was paid two or three different ways. I was in the minority, I guess. I was told by four or five managers at my firm, you're making other salesmen angry, Larry. 
you can't publicly advertise commission-free mutual funds. I thought the code of ethics would rule over the code of silence, but I was wrong. I am instructing you not to answer that question. In accordance to the terms of the contractual obligations undertaken by you, not to disclose any information about your work. That means you don't talk. Despite being fully deregulated in 1987, I don't think to this day that you'll find any broker ads showing clients how to buy mutual funds free of commission. Discount broker ads maybe, but no ads from a trusted, full-service advisor. You would think that a trusted advisor would tell you these things, that you can freely negotiate your fund charges, that most sales can earn the broker two commissions. My third lesson, and the one that finally told me I had to leave this industry, was when a salesman bragged to me that he had $38 million in mutual funds that he intended to switch to house brand funds. He and the firm would increase commissions or fees to the firm by about $750,000 if he were to do this. When these new house brand funds came along, the firm was able to keep 100% of the management fees in-house. He quickly learned that his annual income would go up by about 10 times if he moved all of his clients' money there. He bragged to me about being able to move all these clients to the fee-based accounts and generate about three quarters of a million dollars. He did not concern himself with the interests of the clients, just that he could place them in a fund where the broker could now get himself into a better fee arrangement, about 10 times better for the broker. Even though the compliance department knew of the problem, sales managers with sales figures dancing in their heads won out over client protection. It was the final straw for me. It became clear that violating the code of silence and speaking up on behalf of clients just caused me to be labeled not a team player. The work environment got tougher and tougher after that. My personal dilemma was this. What if your company has a code of silence that says nothing can be spoken of outside the company without management approval. And yet when you witness violations of the public trust, management chooses to cover up the violations and earn a greater bonus. Does the management approval rule allow bad managers and bad salespeople to cover up client abuses? Does it come before the code of ethics? I could not imagine this would ever be possible. We have a code of ethics that says every transaction we are involved in will stand the test of complete, open, public scrutiny. So my question still remains, what do you do if you have to report wrongs to the very people whose salary or bonus may be benefiting from the wrongs? What do you do when they prefer to see no evil? This is how I started a new chapter and a new direction in my life, and this is what I learned after I left the industry.